America has Hollywood, but we have got national insurance. For the title of my paper, I have chosen the motto from an article published in June 1949. In it, its author, Josef Schrich, pondered the significance of an expansive welfare state under communist dictatorship in the following way. Uh, quotation. America has not got our national insurance, but she has Hollywood. And she is forced to has, have Hollywood simply because she has no national insurance. America has chosen a movie illusion. We have opted for social security. Consider for yourself who has made the better choice. The date of this statement, June 1949, is important. It reveals the way in which the public discourse on America was radically transformed only four years after Second World War. In 1945, the United States enjoyed a positive reputation in the Czechoslovak Republic for the following reasons. We can divide them into three groups. Long-term reasons, America as the bearer of modernity and liberal democracy. Although its reputation fell slightly due to newspaper accounts on the impact of Great Depression, but Roosevelt and New Deal after 1933 has been admired across the spectrum of Czechoslovak political parties during 1930s. Medium-term reasons. The United States wasn't a signatory of the Munich Agreement of 1938, which forced Czechoslovakia to hand over its borderland with majority German populations to Hitler. In comparison to Czechoslovakia's traditional allies, France and Great Britain, America could still be considered a possible guardian of Czechoslovak independence. And short-term reasons, America was a liberator from Hitler's occupation. On the other hand, we can observe the seeds of mutual distrust begin to bear fruit immediately after the war. America procrastinated before finally officially opening its embassy in post-war Prague on June 1, 1945. At least some of the key players were aware of this problem. Prague charged the affair. Alfred Clifford was determined that the United States develop genuine political influence in Prague. And he knew that time was of the essence. Quotation, the long delay in our arrival, he warned, caused a certain feeling of despair in the country. He explained that some democratic politicians had started to wonder whether Western allies had abandoned Czechoslovakia to the Russians, while many Czechs and Slovaks were grateful to the Soviet liberators, there was, according to his mind, no question that America was the most popular foreign country with most of the people. Here we can see landmarks of Czechoslovak-American relations during so-called Third Republic, so I will start. Uh, American diplomats were well aware of uh, this fact. And the post-war head of the American embassy found out later, after communist coup d'etat apparent connection between the Czechoslovak insecurity about the true American intentions and the fall of democracy in this Central European country. Ambassador Lawrence Steinhardt noted that Czechoslovaks had felt written off by the West since 1943, when Banesh had had a non-committal reception in Washington, in contrast to the false promises he had been getting from Moscow. Then came Yalta and the sense that Europe was divided into spheres of influence and that the Czechs were placed on the Soviet side. This may not have been accurate, but it was confirmed from the Czech perspective when the U.S. Army stopped in Pilsen. 
If Czechs and Slovaks had doubts about the American determination to defend political democracy and the Western orientation of Central Europe, Americans in turn were doubtful of Czechoslovakia's ability to balance between the West and the East. And these doubts became more and more substan substantiated by the activities of the Czechoslovak government. For example, the nationalization of enterprises, the permanent support of Soviet concerns proclaimed by Czechoslovak delega delegation in the United Nations, and of course, the che Czechoslovak rejection of the Marshall Plan coercively demanded by Stalin. Charge of Clifford seated above was not the only key American who addressed the further development of democratic Czechoslovakia and the popular confidence of its inhabitants in America in an optimistic way. Other important American actors also shared this Clifford's conviction. The most important one um, uh, and the most important one among them was, of course, the first post-war ambassador, Lawrence Steinhardt, who was appointed by President Truman in the spring of 1945. Although the historiographical assessment of Steinhardt has been ambivalent, at least, in 1945, he seemed to be a good choice for a position that many in Washington considered a laboratory for testing America's relations with Stalin. Steinhardt was optimistic in his dispatch from the September 1945, just six weeks before the enactment of nationalization. According to his mind, Banish was skillful and the moderates in the government had lost no ground. They might even have scored some gains. And Steinhardt continued in his dispatch. I don't believe that there is any danger of revolutionary activities or of a collapse. I think this possibility is behind us. You may now look forward to steady improvement. Even the program of nationalization will probably not go as far as I was first feared. But reality demolished wishful thinking soon enough. Some could argue that Czechoslovakia had a mixed economy that combined state and privately owned assets. But over 60% of all industrial workers were employed in nationalized establishments and the state sector dominated the economic life of the country. It controlled access to raw materials, bank credits, and even the workforce the large state factories could easily choke off all competitors by denying them supplies, transportation, and access to markets. The nationalization decrees were a rude awakening for Steinhardt, and he was forced to admit that the measures were more extensive than he had expected. Nationalization decrees and the subsequent currency reform had destroyed the market economy and directly hurt American interests. It was widely believed that elections of 1946, uh, that the election's outcome, uh, depended to an extent on their timing. Banish and Democrats wanted to have the elections as soon as possible and the Communist Party wished to postpone them. Communists needed time to consolidate the power they had graped and to allow the memoirs of the Red Army's behavior to fade. American Secret Service as well as Embassy were in case of the estima estimation of the results very optimistic. You can see them below. And in absence of hard news from Ambassador Steinhardt, few in Washington were paying attention to the situation in Prague. They were satisfied that Banesh was, according to Steinhardt's reports, constantly pressing the government for the restitution of the democratic institutions. Having been fed such sunny reports from Prague, it is not surprising that the Department of State 
So no reason to mobilize against the communist threat to Czechoslovak democracy. American experience with the nationalization and elections result, resulted, uh, election results caused more cautious stance toward Czechoslovakia. At the end of September, the Department of State informed the Czechoslovak embassy that in the absence of compensation to American nationals for their rights and properties nationalized in 1945, the Department of State was suspending all negotiation regarding any loan applications. Embassy in this insisted that Czechoslovakia should play a more independent role in international affairs and it should compensate those American citizens whose property, uh, property had been nationalized. When the Czechoslovaks fulfilled these and other related preconditions, Washington would respond positively to plea of President Banesh for close and friendly relations between the two countries. This, cert this certainly appeared to make sense in Washington, not in post-war Prague, where the Communist Party had won a recent election Country's foreign policy was coordinated with Moscow, although large enterprises had been nationalized and the general public was passive. The last important issue was European recovery program, so-called Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan has always been considered in the historiography as the point of no return. American coolness toward Czechoslovakia advocated by Steinhardt to accelerate its willingness to compensate American owners of nationalized properties, played into the hands of the radical communist elements who wished to isolate the country from the West. It was easy to persuade then the general public that the Soviet Union was the one and only warrantor of Czechoslovakia. On June 5th, 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall, in a speech at Harvard, uh, Harvard University, presented a plan for the economic rehabilitation of Europe. It might help reduce the chasm between East and West and thus make the Czechoslovak position more comfortable. Although Czechoslovak government had confirmed on July 4th that Czechoslovakia would have attended Paris conference on the plan, Stalin summoned the Czechs to Moscow then, and for the Czechs to go to Paris, Stalin declared, would be intolerable. At the beginning of 1947, many in Washington had still believed that a conciliatory path with Stalin could be found. By the end of the year, the optimistic camp had shrunk significantly. Prominent among uh, the pessimists was Secretary of State George Marshall. In his memorandum for Truman, he predicted that Moscow, I am sitting, will probably have to clamp down on Czechoslovakia for a relatively free Czechoslovakia could become a threatening salient in Moscow's political position. CIA warned that as early as January 1948, Communist Party might make every effort to achieve their objectives in Czechoslovakia by constitutional rather than extra-legal means. CIA was completely right, except the timing. The constitutional crisis emerged a month later. Oh, I forgot Marshall. Oh. <clears throat> uh, Ambassador Steinhardt wrote in March 1948 after communist coup d'etat following words, I am quoting. Hindsight now indicates that further attention by us to the political aspects of the war might have given us control of Central Europe at the nominal cost. This bold statement was addressed to Secretary George Marshall, who, previously as General Marshall, had supported Eisenhower's tendency to prosecute the final stage of the war as it had existed outside the realm of politics. The future of Czechoslovakia, Steinhardt knew, was hopeless. 
He dismissed as fanciful all plans to create a resistance organization against the communist regime. It had no chance of success, he warned, because the simple reason that Czechoslovakia was a police state. The split in historiographical interpretation of this period of Czechoslovak history has been mirroring the disputes among the partakers involved in the political struggle. Brilliant political analyst George Cannon concluded that Czechoslovakia's proximity to Soviet Union sufficed to predict the country's political future. In his view, the Soviet leaders recognized, I am quoting, only vessels and enemies, and the neighbors of Russia, if they do not wish to be the one, must reconcile themselves to being the other. The Poles chose to resist, and Stalin was going to crush them, Kennan predicted. The Czechs had tried to appease Stalin, nevertheless, like the Poles, they were destined to find them, themselves under the Russian jackboot. On the contrary, Alan Dahls, reflecting on signs of unrest in Eastern Europe in the 1950s, stressed how important it was for the United States never to repeat the mistakes that had been made in post-war Czechoslovakia. That country, Dahls said, would never have been lost if someone had been there doing something about it. Thank you.